Hi, I'm Jennifer Hubbard, a student of USC School of Gerontology and a resident of Sun Valley, Idaho, a town where they say the people at any age know how to live life fully. With an elevation of nearly 6,000 feet, some say it may be just a little closer to heaven. Along with some of Sun Valley's well-known Olympic athletes and one-time home of Ernest Hemingway, Sun Valley is known for having one of the best hospice and palliative centers in the United States. I'd like to introduce you to the Executive Director of Wood River Valley, Carolyn Nystrom. Well, thank you for being here and thank you for speaking to USC. And so I wanted to just get started with a few questions. And before we really go anywhere, I want to know the history of how you got started, where you went to school, what you did, and how you ended up in Sun Valley. Good. Well, I started out um, at Merritt Hospital, and a Merritt grad in Oakland, California. And um, after I graduated, um, I've always been sort of a, I think I would have been a good pioneer because um, I always like to be sort of on the cutting edge of uh, new frontiers of of healthcare. So after I graduated, I wanted to be sure that I didn't lose all the skill and knowledge I had learned. So I did an um, emergency room, and then from there I went to intensive care. And then um, I took about 15 years off and raised children. And when I returned to the field, then I came into hospice. So I did hospice there for 10 years before I came here. My husband had been a ski instructor here, always wanted to live here, and so then we moved here, and I didn't work the first year, and but for the last 24 years, I've been doing this. So, um, when did you start? I mean, were you always here in this little red building, or... Did you start? No, it started, it was in the basement of the old hospital at uh, Moritz up in Sun Valley. And then as that hospital grew, they needed more space. And so then we rented this space and then we eventually purchased it. And so that's, so we've been here since then. And how many years is that? We moved here in 94. We moved here in 94. And was that a vision that you had all along? I mean, is that something that you had hoped for, you thought it would go that direction? Yes and no. Um, when I came, the organization was only bereavement support and volunteer support. It didn't have the medical nursing. It wasn't a full um, service hospice program. But because i that's what I had known in California when I came, I wanted to develop the program so that it would be a full-service hospice program. Um, that was my vision. Um, that's what I sort of thought about having happen here. Um, but then I wasn't prepared for kind of how enthusiastic this community was about end-of-life care, um, how eager the medical community was for um, the practice. Um, it was new to people, um, so that was a little challenging. Um, so then it has just blossomed into, you know, just more and more. Um, well, what kind of advice can you give to any of the USC students that may want to take your business plan and start something similar in another area? I think when, especially when you are a student and you're getting all this knowledge, and especially as you, the degrees get higher and you think you have more knowledge, I think if you're going to try to start to do something, go as a learner, not a teacher. Because I think our tendency is to go and think we have a lot of knowledge and get enthusiastic. Oh, I'm going to do this, and I know all this, and I have a lot of you know knowledge. Um, but I think always if you go um, as a learner and not a teacher, um, that that's a valuable thing, ask questions, um, find out what people need, um, 
I don't think there's really any experts in the field. I've said that many, many times. Um, I think there are people with a lot of experience, and I think there's leaders. Um, but it's a very dynamic field, and it changes all the time. Um, gerontology is going to be the same way. Um, we're finding out more about the diseases that affect the elderly population. Um, we're finding out more and more um, both about the field, about caregiving. Um, so there's going to be a lot of issues. And then you put that along with the silver tsunami or whatever you want to call the baby boomers as they age mm -hmm. and how they'll want to be cared for at the end or how um, age is going to affect them is going to be a continually learning process. So I would say that you need to, you know, know what you know, but have that openness or that curiosity to be a continual learner um, and not think As that the changes. end of your education, okay, so now I know it all. <laughs> now and I move know forward. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and I would say, Ask questions, um, honor people's wishes, um, and not try to do it all at one time. Start small and expand. Um, I know when I first came, because I came from a huge program in, in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, and one of the interview questions that um, when I was hired, someone asked, well, was I going to be really bored coming here uh, because I had been in such a large program um, in such a sophisticated area? Um, and I had taught graduate students at Stanford, and that's probably a bad word to say. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's where I was. So, um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but... Um, And I said, it's like moving from a big house to a much smaller house here. Mm -hmm. There would be some things I could use right away, some things I would put in storage and maybe use at a later date, and some things I would have to buy new to fit the new situation and the new house. And I felt like my job was like that as well. <laughs> Very well stated. <laughs> well, um... Do you think it's possible to duplicate what you have here in another country? Oh, absolutely in another country. Um, the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization has a program for um, hospices in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And so they have a huge partnership uh, program where hospices in this country partner with a hospice in Africa. Um, some of them provide financial support, but many of them provide uh, training, um, provide ideas, creativity, because they're, all their workers in Africa are really just lay people trained. They're not nurses, they're not social workers, they're um, just people that are heartful and want to do the work. Um, they work with very limited resources. So those of us that are in rural hospices are particularly beneficial to them because we do more with less. We tend to be a little more creative um, and so have been really helpful in providing models or helping models that aren't the Medicare model um, that are more like ours are mm -hmm. with um, high utilization of uh, volunteers. So when you retire, what hopes do you have for the future of hospice and palliative care? Or Sun Valley? <laughs> or well, County? that it would continue to be a role model. Um, for the country, that um, it per continues to provide um, the excellence in care, um, 
that whoever follows me keeps that um, sort of open heart, uh, curious mind, um, because there will be other things that will come. I mean, we didn't do caregiving when I first came. I mean, train caregivers, support caregivers, um, outside of the family members that we were, of the patients we were caring for. But now we have um, uh, two support groups, plus we provide, have a caregiver retreat for family members that are caring for people that are old, that are that have Parkinson's, mm -hmm. that have Alzheimer's, but they're not at the end of their life. They're not appropriate for our care, so our nurses aren't seeing them all the time. But the or post-stroke people or people with a lot of physical limitations um, can be very wearing, and that is going to be yeah. it's huge now, and it's going to be. I mean, yeah. there's three hundred. I mean, I think the last. Um, number I read that 300,000 teenagers go home every day after school to care for a grandparent that is living in their home. Um, so that's going to be an increasing issue. Everyone's taking care of everyone. Right. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. For those that don't understand the difference between palliative care and hospice care, mm -hmm. Can you sort of summarize that? Yeah, hospice care, um, all hospice care is palliative. It's, in other words, that's all comfort care. Mm -hmm. um, but all palliative care is not hospice care. So hospice care is really when people are predictably at the end of their life. The Medicare benefit says six months. Mm -hmm. um, where palliative care can begin at any time of a serious illness. So if people are diagnosed with um, cancer, um, palliative care um, can help with pain management, symptom control, family dynamics, um, or if someone has Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, ALS, congestive heart failure, um, COPD, a lot of those chronic illnesses, once they're at a point where, I mean, you know that Parkinson's, at least right now, we don't have a cure for that. We don't have a cure for ALS. We don't mm -hmm. have a cure for Alzheimer's. Um, hospice, or if those people go into a palliative care program, then you have staff or volunteers that can provide respite for the family, can help families, give them guidance about uh, maybe foods that are easier for people to swallow, um, can support the family caregiver. Um, it's just that extra layer of comfort. Um, and I think early interventions from palliative care, if people haven't made out their living will, haven't done their advanced yeah. directives, then the you know, we do a lot of that because you want people to, well, I mean, people should do them when they're 18, but um, many people in the country don't, um, haven't completed those. And so you want those done, for instance, with someone with dementia or f when they're beginning to get forgetful. Yeah. You don't want to, you want to be able to sh talk with them, have them fill out those advanced directives before they're unable to. Um, but it's wonderful work. Um, I think the relationships are the most rewarding part of it. Relationships with patients and families, relationships with physicians, with the community. Um, I'm a very strong proponent of hospice and palliative care programs being part of the fabric of a community, not just some program that people, that they go to the, like this little red house or, um, but that you're really integrated into the community because I think um, dying is part of living. And um, so those connections, those relationships are really vital. Um, and you can't be an island Hospice and palliative care is part of the whole healthcare continuum, and I think the more partnerships and relationships are 
are really valuable. Well, thank you for everything you've done, well, for being the pioneer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Not at all. Yeah, all no, happy to do it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Bound for home. Back to what I know. Back to Idaho.